Dwarf and super dwarf reticulated pythons are some of the coolest species you can keep. But how the heck do you do it? I'm going to tell you how I do it and maybe how a couple other people do it. Care guide. Here we go. Hey, don't leave yet. We're still doing a thing. Stella, hey, can I, can you please just, just for a little, no, don't, don't climb on it. Don't get on there. You know what's fun? Oh, my neck is fun. Oh, ha ha. Got it. I got him back. Stella's leaving the set, I guess. She's got other things to do. Welcome to the green room. I'm Bob Bledsoe, and these two wily troublemakers are my super dwarf reticulated pythons. Oh, that's real smart, holding two man-eating snakes at the same time. Well, they aren't man-eating snakes, Kent. Are they reticulated pythons? Yeah. Has a reticulated python ever eaten a man? Technically, yes, Kent, and I'm really impressed that you know something about snakes. But if my brother gets eaten, call 911 because I probably won't even have time to run out of the room before I'm in the other one's belly. Thanks for the protocol, Kent. Hello, can you come back and join us? What do you think? You wanna crawl on my head? Can you come down from there and join us on this thing? We're doing a thing here. You gonna stay up there? These snakes are reticulated pythons, but they're super dwarf, which means they don't get nearly as big as their mainland cousins, but they are still technically retics and they have the same intelligence and the interactivity and the curiosity that makes retics so popular just in a much smaller package. So that's why these retics specifically have become very popular in the last several years. Hey, what are you doing? Where'd Stella go? Oh my gosh. You gonna hang out there? Is that your deal? You're gonna be right there? For those wondering, reticulated pythons can basically be found all over this section of the earth. Within this massive area, there are regions or localities where the retics look different as far as color and pattern, slightly different, maybe head structure, but more importantly, size. The smallest localities are found on a few islands. Where am I at? Oh my gosh, I can't even see. Where, where even are we? Oh, did I cover it up? Dang it, I did this really sloppy. A few of the localities, I gotta make my circle different to fit, here we go, let's fit this area in. The smallest localities are found on a few islands right here, basically. You can't even see the islands. I probably covered all of them with that dot almost. For any of the retic nerds wondering, Echo is 50% Karampa, 25% Kalatoa, and 12.5% Slayer, and Stella is just 100% Kalatoa. By the way, it should be noted that Stella is almost two years old, Echo just turned two, and they're both exactly the same size, but not nearly adult sized yet. They have a lot of growing left to do. As with my ball python care guide, this is how I keep my snakes. There are numerous ways to successfully keep a snake, so if you do it differently, that's fantastic. I'm a relatively experienced snake keeper, but I'm not as experienced with retics. I'm only two years into keeping two super dwarfs. But I have a special guest, maybe two, who have kept retics for years, both mainlands and dwarves and super dwarves. So we're gonna get some expert input on this as well. Let's talk about caging. You may have a reticulated python who is roughly the same size as a large ball python, at least in weight. They're gonna be longer and skinnier, but about in weight. But they're much more active, as you can see. So they need bigger space. Hatchling retics do really well in a small tub, just like hatchling ball pythons or anything else, because their only concern really is to hide and stay away from danger, and those small enclosures make them feel safe. But once they get some size and confidence, to them, they're gonna need a little bit more space than that. You're gonna find that they'll be up sometimes during the day, a lot of times during the night. They're just awake and moving a lot more than a ball python, if that's what you're comparing these to. They're gonna do well in a large enclosure. You might have a ball python who doesn't do well in a large enclosure because they're just not a confident snake. You're gonna rarely find a retic that doesn't do well in a large enclosure. In fact, I would say almost never. I like PVC enclosures because you'll be able to control all your parameters better with PVC plus glass enclosures, there's a good chance that your snake's gonna grow out of any size fish tank that you could put them in. So I would just set them up with a PVC. My two retics are actually due for a cage upgrade and they're gonna get one a little bit later on this year, but they're also in a unique situation where they can roam around freely a lot of the time. I work from home when I'm, when I'm not traveling. So these snakes get to spend a lot of time outside their cage, which I think is important to have things like this and the top of this cage and wherever they want to roam 
to get that exercise. Just get some ab work in. You need some ab work, huh, Echo? Hey, can you, are you ready to come back with me? Can you do this now? Hey, friend, can you come back? No? All right. I just got a new AC put in. How long is this gonna last? I have these black box PVC cages that work great for super dwarfs. By the way, GRP is your discount code if you go to blackboxcages.com. But I keep them pretty easy to clean, but also I rotate enrichment items through. So they're always getting like a, a ball or a whiskey sleeve or a new like cliff ledge somewhere in there. They spend a lot of time checking things out and when something changes in their enclosure, they are all over it. They wanna know everything about it and they spend a lot of time figuring that out. I also do that with this ladder. I have two hooks that hang from the ceiling and I can hang different enrichment items. Right now they've got their basket. This is kind of their favorite thing, so I often have this. I have sort of two baskets that they can crawl on, but I have netting and all kinds of stuff so that each time they come out for enrichment and climb that thing, they've got something a little bit different. Hey, are you, are you ready now? Are you ready now? Can you come and hang out with us, please? Come hang out. We're talking about you in this. I use cocoa husk for bedding for these guys. I don't think they care. Echo spends most of her time in her sky hide and Stella spends most of her time in her basket, neither of which has substrate in it. So I don't think they really care what's on the ground. And the substrate is really important in maintaining humidity. So whatever works for you to keep the humidity up and keep things clean in there is the best way to go. But, I mean, paper actually works really well for a lot of people. And again, the snakes don't care, especially if you have different levels for them and things like that that they can crawl on, it doesn't really matter. I could do an entire video on the various sizes of dwarf and super dwarf retics, but the fact is that there is a massive difference in sizes based on genetics, localities, percentages, all kinds of stuff. You know, with ball pythons, we can say that an adult ball python gets somewhere between four to five feet long, maybe five and a half. Damara is five and a half feet long uh, with some outliers. There's one locality, Volta, that gets quite a bit bigger. But other than that, figure four to five feet for your ball python. Dwarf and super dwarf retakes, you could have a high percentage, small locality super dwarf that only is seven or eight feet long and skinny. And you could also have like a 14 foot chubster that needs a massive custom built cage. So as far as the size of your cage that you're going to need, you, you just don't know. Echo is a high percentage super dwarf with Karampa and Kalatoa blood, which are supposed to be the two smallest localities. And Stella is 100% Kalatoa. They're supposed to be small, but you just don't know. It's hard to predict. So we're getting into a separate video about sizes, but the point is that once your snake is beyond hatchling size, hi babes, you trying to crawl in my mouth? Once your snake is beyond hatchling size, get them a cage that they can roam around in. And if you can provide them some area outside their cage, whether it's in your home like this or outside, that they can cruise around. My buddy Eric Lee has an amazing group of super dwarf and dwarf reticulated pythons. And I visited him recently and he's got this awesome outdoor thing that he made for his snakes. So let me show you that. So for anyone trained in the art of PVC piping, a thing like this could be made. Eric, uh, how many hundreds of thousands of dollars did this cost you? Surprisingly, the PVC was probably $30, $40. The most expensive thing here, and it doesn't look like it, is the rope. The rope, yeah. And because I legitimately have, like, I think I have 700 feet on here. <laughs> Just because I wound Do you it really? wow. super crazy tight because of my OCD. And I think I spent $80 on that. So obviously, you don't have to do it so tight. But, but the fact is that this is a, I mean... You did a lot of stuff that you don't necessarily have to do, but this is a cheap and easy Absolutely. thing to build. And it's amazing, and the snakes dig it. I always love seeing the footage of your snakes hanging out out here on this thing. This is a mainland male. It's a year and a half old. So beautiful. This rainbow or ocelot. Ocelot or, yeah. You just call them those two things. Yeah. Rainbow or ocelot, right, are the two. Look at that. Look at that head. <laughs> Is it in camera? Yeah, I can't tell if it's in camera. camera yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. So cool. Let's talk about temps. This is almost like a ball python, but a bit cooler. I keep my retics on the warm side at about 87, 88, somewhere around there. And the cool side in the high 70s. 
Now you can keep them like a ball python. The general rule for ball pythons is 80 on the cool side, 90 on the warm. But I think that for most retics, 90 on the warm is gonna cause them to start pushing. When they get too warm, they start pushing and they'll mess up their nose. Eric Lee keeps his retics even cooler than I do. Check it out. You're keeping them cooler than a lot of people. Your, your yeah. So um, my hot spots for all the cake, everything in here has a heat, supplemental heat source and those are usually about 84 degrees. Ambient in this room varies from the daytime high about 82, maybe up to 83, 84, depending on outside temperatures also. But at nighttime, I usually let it drop to about 76, 77. And even I've let it go a little bit lower sometimes about like 75-ish. So basically your hot spot is in the mid 80s. Mid 80s. Mid yeah. to low 80s. Yep. Okay. And so they take a little bit longer to digest. Correct. Uh, mine are more in the high 80s okay. right now, but I'm going to I'm going to bump it down. Okay. But so they're minor digesting That's faster. faster. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much to Eric Lee for his expertise in showing us his awesome animals. All right, do you want to escape too? You want to go climb on your thing? Okay. There you go. You're off. Go find a good spot. We're gonna talk about various heat sources while I scroll the fine folks over on Patreon who make up the horde of keepers. The cages that both of my super dwarves in are heated with radiant heat panels. That works fine for them, but so would a CHE or a deep heat projector, anything that provides heat that's non-lighted. You just don't want a heat lamp because you need to be able to turn that light off at night and retics still need the heat. It's good to see what other people are doing, but different cages and different rooms are gonna require different things, so you may just have to experiment with it. Retics don't need belly heat, but if your cage requires that to give them the heat that they need, you can do a heat mat. What are you doing? Are you coming down to help me with the boards? These snakes don't require UV lighting, but my guess is they can benefit from it. The jury's still out on that. I have Stella on UV and I have Echo without UV, and so far I haven't really noticed a difference. Hey, what are you doing? Thank you so much to the Patreon supporters and to the channel sponsors, Black Box Cages, Lane Labs, and Gray Family Snakes. There are your discount codes. Wait, aren't we going to do Kent's Corner? I hadn't planned on it, Kent. This is going to be a long video. But you know what? Maybe we could do some exposure phobia therapy with you. I could just hold Echo while standing next to you on camera. No way! That snake has bitten you so many times you're immune to the venom. I'd be dead in an instant. Kent, you said venom instead of poison. That's the second time you've said something accurate about snakes. Even while saying something wildly inaccurate, but it shows that you're learning something. Still though, keep that death viper away from me. He still has a little ways to go. A crucial piece of equipment when keeping reptiles is a temperature gun. This tells you the surface temps on the cold side and warm side. I use this piece of equipment more than just about anything else in the snake room. It's also good to have a thermometer hygrometer in the cage. I use it more for the hygrometer because this is what really tells me what the surface temps are. Humidity. I keep the super dwarves at about 60%. The fact is that retex can handle a wide range of humidities. I wouldn't let it get down under 50% for too long and over 80 seems a little excessive, but somewhere in the middle of that wide range is gonna be fine for them. They usually shed just great. To maintain proper humidity, you wanna mix water directly into your substrate. If you're using paper as substrate, just have a big water bowl and keep that on the warm side. That should keep your humidity up. Speaking of water, I provide my snakes with fresh water and I change it every few days and clean out the water dishes. The difference with the super dwarves is that their water dish doubles as a swimming pool for them. Reticulated pythons enjoy the water and uh, it's just extra enrichment for them. I would love to give them like a big pond that they can actually swim through, but these are Tupperware tubs and they tend to crawl through them and that's just extra enrichment that's really easy to provide. There are a few aspects about keeping super dwarf retics that make them easier than ball pythons and a few things that are a little bit more challenging. One of the more challenging things is that your snake could get considerably bigger than a ball python and food response bites are more common with retics than they are with ball pythons. As long as you work with them regularly, they're probably not gonna be defensive, but they are very food motivated. So you've gotta be able to read their body language if you're not trying to get bit. And really, it just depends on the individual snake. Stella always tongue flicks before she strikes. She has never bit me, she has never almost bit me. Echo, on the other hand, has no problem sinking her teeth into me as soon as my heat signature comes into range of her. It usually happens during a live stream when I'm not paying attention on feeding day. Um, oh my gosh, Echo, seriously? <laughs> Stop. 
One of the things that you'll find a little bit easier than a ball python is your retic will never miss a meal. The challenge then becomes how much do you feed it? I see a lot of people pounding their snakes with food and they get really big and fat. And then I see people underfeeding because they're trying to keep their snakes small, but that's unhealthy too. Echo and Stella get varied diets, not only in just different prey items like rodents and birds, things like that, but also different sizes. Sometimes I'll give them a small meal, sometimes I'll give them a bigger meal. When I was visiting Eric, I asked him about his feed schedule because he's been doing it for years and all of his snakes have awesome body conditions. So here's what he does. I have a five day old hatchling right here. So cute. What, what are we looking at? This is probably a Kalatoa. This is a 78.125 Kalatoa, six and a quarter jamp, uh, purple platinum snow. I think it's the first one ever made, possibly. So cool. So a snake this size and this young, what is your feeding schedule? I'll probably start it off on a rat pinky probably every five to seven days for probably, once it's an established feeder, I'll probably just keep it at the rat pinky size for probably about once a week for the first year. Okay, so once a week for the first year. And then what about this size? This oh, girl is a December 2020 girl. It's a 50% Kalatoa, six and a quarter percent Jamp, Purple Sun, Posshead Anry. And right now she gets a weaned rat about every 10 days or so. Okay, so weaned rat is going to leave a little bit of a lump. Yeah. Not, not a huge lump. Yeah. Let's say you got a super dwarf that's about this size. What would you be feeding this guy? That guy right now is on, I think, uh, I have him on small rats right now. He's going to get bumped up to mediums pretty soon. And he's getting fed about roughly every 10 days, give or take. Sometimes sooner, depending on if he's like getting more food driven but roughly about every 10 days right now. And he, he'll be two in May, so next month. Okay, and at two years old, you switch them to every two weeks, right? Yeah, every two weeks, sometimes I'll try to push it out farther, just depending on the individual snakes. Some snakes don't mind it. Others will start getting more like food driven and kind of bitey, so then I shorten it. But for the ones that are okay with it, I'll leave them on it. Okay, so this girl, what's, what, what are you feeding her? She gets a jumbo rat about every 10 to 14 days. I usually try to push it, but she's kind of hit or miss. One minute she's okay with two, two and a half weeks. Next minute she needs to eat about every 10 days. So it kind of it fluctuates. Okay. But I shoot for about two weeks and she's a three year old. She's a little over eight foot. In here we have a 10 year old pure Kalatoa. She's a big girl and she's cycling right now possibly. So we're not gonna pull her out. But Eric, for this snake, this is a quite a bit bigger snake. Right here, I'm feeding her a jumbo rat right now about every 10 days because she's getting really bitey where she's biting the lip of the cage when I walk by just because I, she's just, her body's at, you know, needing all those calories for breeding. Right, but if she wasn't breeding, let's say she was just a pet. Every two weeks. Every two weeks. Because, I mean, at 10 years old, I mean, she's still growing, but not, she's not been growing a ton. And she's about probably, I'd say, nine and a half, 10 feet. Right. And, and it's also uh, good to note that She's been breeding size for a number of years, I would imagine, right? Correct, yeah. Since she's, she was probably four years old. Yeah, she's given me, I think, three clutches. And when she was when she was breeding size, she probably could have been half that size and still breed. Yeah, right? I mean, they can breed at about four years old, and at four years old, they're going to be in that six, seven foot range, but that's a breeder size and not an adult size because... Most, all I'd say most retics are going to be growing until they're between that 10 to 12 years of age. At that time, they'll probably slow down. They'll probably never really stop. But this increase in size would be a lot smaller than up to that 10 to 12 years mark. Right. So she's probably at at uh, pretty close to max, even though she'll get a little bit bigger each each year. Both my super dwarfs are target trained. It didn't take much time at all. These are really smart animals. I use target training as a food cue for them, but also to provide their brains with a little bit of enrichment. It's definitely not necessary, but I do recommend at least hook training or tap training your snakes if you're not doing the target thing, just so that they can understand the difference between a food encounter and a non-food encounter. It doesn't always work, especially with Echo, who's always looking for a food opportunity, but it's nice to be able to establish that the only time they're gonna get fed is when they see this blue target. They're always looking for something to run by or fly by, but the fact is that anytime they've ever gotten a food opportunity, they've seen that target first and interacted with it. And that's just a great thing to establish with the snakes, I think. Target training is a separate video though. In fact, it's this one. I hope this helps with your keeping or planning to keep of tiny retics. 
Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.